Thank you to everyone who has invited me um, to, to talk about criminalization of key populations. Um, um, everything that has to do with criminalization is something that I'm particularly oddly passionate about because it's part of my um, background. I'm a recovering academic. I used to be an academic until quite recently and I have been a criminologist for 35 years. So when I left academia, I was a professor of criminology and most of my work has been um, try to understand and deconstruct what criminalization means to different population groups. But so I want to start by, um, so that's my introduction. These are kind of the housekeeping that already Chris explained really well, but I want to add something. Um, I want to make sure that this is a, a place where we can use a language which is not violent and is not derogative in any way. So I respect each other's um, opinions very much, but in a way that are respectful. Um, please do stop me at any time if um, uh, what I say is not clear or is upsetting you or is triggering something for you. This is, as I see it, I see it very much as a kind of interacting uh, opportunity rather than me lecturing uh, on um, on a topic that, as I said, I'm particularly passionate about. So this is the agenda for today. I've done already the introduction. I also should have said that I'm currently the executive director of the European AIDS Treatment Group. So far, so good. I love my job. I love the opportunities that my job uh, offers me. Um, and I see this as an opportunity today and in many other settings to talk more about uh, uh, what matters to, to me, which is my communities, my tribe. And this is one of the very many opportunities. Um, I will start talking uh, a little bit about what I think uh, is the creation of key populations. What does it mean? What it is? How it came about? Uh, um, which I hope will lead me to explain uh, what I think is the production of suitable enemies, uh, which links very much to any conversation we could have about criminalization. And that's why I said conversation, because then uh, I hope there will be already some questions uh, for you to, to ask, also um, opportunities to share um, your thoughts, your ideas. Then I will again, spend some time uh, to talk about the effect on criminalization on key populations. And uh, this will be almost a summary because I'm, I'm sure that everything I'll say is has already been said, but it's a way of kind of recapping. Uh, um, and then again, an opportunity for us to talk more uh, in details about some of the key points that I hope I will uh, clearly explain. And then I've decided that um, it could be quite useful for us to talk uh, or dissect some case studies, and I've chosen two. Um, I don't want to spoil the surprise, so I'm not going to tell what the case studies are. But they're very broad in general, which again, my um, my intention is to kind of to provoke a conversation. Again, after the case studies, another break, so also you don't uh, hear my voice constantly. And then I think it's important for me, uh, most of everything else that we're going to discuss today, how we respond as, as communities. And that's why I mentioned earlier my tribe. So this is about the alchemy of collaboration. Who are the, the important stakeholders? But what can we do as communities? There will be, I hope, some sort of take home message uh, uh, at the end. I was asked to finish five minutes earlier, although I was uh, already deprived of uh, a few minutes uh, because we started late, but I will try to make the take home message as short and sharp as possible. And then there will be a short summary. Because I have already spent a lot of time on uh, introducing the agenda, I might as well go straight to, to the first point. And the first point for me, because of a recovering academic, is very much making sure that whatever we discuss has some sort of learning outcomes. So I hope that we will be able together to find some sort of explanation, or at least the political processes which are underlying criminalization in a very broad sense, and then uh, um, gain some knowledge of the effects of criminalization. But most importantly, as I said already, because it's about my tribe, it's about communities, this council of this knowledge can be applied to advocacy. And again, this is a conversation in the making, so please do stop me at any time. There is something that is particularly important for me to discuss when it 
comes to kind of framing this conversation. So there are three points, at least, that I think are important for me to, to share with you in terms of framing the conversation today. One is decolonization is not a metaphor. So what I'm saying here, I'm borrowing heavily, and I will be borrowing, borrowing heavily from uh, um, critical um, race theory, which, as you probably know, so I do apologize in advance if I sound too much like a boring teacher. This is very much about um, the borrowing from the intellectual, if you like, and social movement, uh, and also the um, the kind of very loosely organized uh, legal framework uh, uh, analysis, which is based on the premises, uh, very important for what we're going to discuss in terms of key populations, that race is not a natural biological um, grounded feature of um, physically distinct subgroups of human beings, but race is a socially constructed, so called culturally invented uh, category that is used to oppress uh, and exploit people of color. A similar uh, standpoint is also when it comes to sex and gender, which I, um, I very much believe are socially constructed. So here, obviously, I'm borrowing from uh, radical gender theory, which is uh, a kind of almost an umbrella term, a catch-all term of academic, embedding academic queer theory, uh, transgender ideologies, uh, gender identity activism. And the premise, again, is that this ideology um, supports the fact that sex and gender are socially constructed. So in other way, this is a kind of um, to do with human uh, invention used as instruments of power, instrument uh, of discrimination, rather than features of uh, objective reality. And finally, um, my conversation is also embedded in the notion that class is not a notion, but is a relevant social determinant. What does it mean? So here I'm borrowing heavily uh, from uh, radical social work theory. Radical social work theory uh, challenges the culture and the status quo and uh, um, for a better word, aims to bring systems of oppression to end through advocacy, community organizing and direct action. That's why it's very important for me as a, a community um, advocate. As a kind of reminder how we frame this conversation, the label of key populations is applied to sex workers, men who have sex with men, transgender communities, people who are using drugs, people in prisons, and uh, people who are uh, forced to be in enclosed settings. I'm thinking about migrants in particular, but also I'm thinking about uh, minors uh, in some instances. In the WHO region, as we all know, key populations are disproportionately affected by HIV, FC, and TB. So far, everything is fine. Are you still alive following me? Everything is uh, in place. Can I move on to a more kind of uh, theoretical um, approach for a second or two or three? Legislation of policies, as you know, that subject key population to criminalization and consequently to arrest, uh, but also prosecution and imprisonment, uh, and particularly I want to highlight imprisonment for what I will discuss later, for engaging in, um, in behaviors that government uh, uh, believe to be not desirable, exists very much today in the WHO Europe region, despite the overwhelming evidence uh, uh, highlighting uh, the negative effect of such interventions. At the end uh, of my slides, which uh, I'm more than happy to share with you, there is a, a list uh, in proper teaching uh, mode, uh, is a list of suggested uh, reading. And I think that you will see from those readings that there is uh, um, overwhelming evidence that everything that we're going to discuss today is nothing new. Um, Everything has been said and researched and described so many times. So it's about time that we move to the next stage, which is what are we going to do about this? I made a disclaimer already that I am a criminologist, so um, I'm not apologizing for framing criminology as a strategy of power. And what do I mean by this? I mean that um, individuals, uh, citizens who sat and I want to stress citizens because some of the key populations that I've listed in one of the previous slides may not have citizens' rights or full citizens' rights. So citizens who stand outside the law are criminalized 
not because they um, threaten the legal order, because they do something that is against the law, which would seem quite logical to most of us, but because they threaten the social order. Remember what I said already in, uh, in a few slides uh, um, ago, everything is kind of that I described class, gender, and race are socially constructed. So what is very much at stake here is the social order. And the way in which I can explain this uh, um, without uh, everyone losing their will to leave is that this process uh, of uh, criminalizing people en masse, irrespectively of what they do against the legal order, against the law, is, um, is almost a feature, I would say, of the state's capacity to um, produce and reproduce and constantly reproduce the social order. There is a, a kind of logic and practice of criminalization, which is embedded in um, kind of in the old days. So this is kind of almost, I'm turning for a second or two, in a sort of uh, uh, history, mini history lesson. This is really the history of the modern state. The modern state uh, um, and how it's organized is really based on the notion of uh, strategies of power and criminalization, in particular of individuals who are deemed by the state to be vulnerable or um, individuals who are deemed by the state uh, as those not useful to the functioning of the state. I'm turning almost into other coming um, lecture here, but um, everything that has to do with the criminalization and the labeling of key populations as the vulnerable ones uh, has to do very much with the fact that some populations are believed, the ones that are deemed as key populations, are believed to be those who are not useful to the functioning of society as it is understood. I hope that makes sense. If not, stop me and I will clarify this. There is another point which I think is very much important in framing the creation of key population. And this is to do with intersecting the marginalized identities. We all know what intersectionality is, but just to frame my conversation today, intersectionality is, uh, is a term used to describe the intersecting, the connecting effects of race, class, and gender, hence what I said earlier, um, another marginalized characteristic that contribute to create social identity and consequently they affect health, health well-being. Intersectionality also, I need to be mindful of time, right, I'm still good. Intersectionality also um, is important for understanding uh, um, the key populations that we have highlighted, highlighted as the most uh, relevant for this conversation. Intersectionality um, is very important for what um, we are going to describe and for understanding health outcomes. But how marginalized identities are created, how we are creating uh, key populations because, for instance, I could have argued that from key populations, uh, we haven't mentioned women. Women are not deemed to be uh, amongst the key populations, but are deemed to be amongst the vulnerable population. This is not just semantic. But so how do we get to create uh, um, these key populations? Why are they important or more important than others? Any idea? So you can stop listening to me for a second. Any idea why this is the case? Okay. No, no, I'll no. Go I think on. we have ideas. <laughs> so, yeah. Sorry, I, just, I was just struggling unmuting myself. <laughs> okay, go and on, Thomas. I think that this is, um, <clears throat> my impression is that <clears throat> all of this boils down to biopolitics and doing biopolitics with various means. Um, whatever the <clears throat> whatever the state has, and I think that um, to respond to your to your actual question, I think that this is um, um, this really is a is a, to me a matter of definition, um, which we may want to influence actively, depending on how invested we are in feminism. <laughs> And and how I don't know. Am I making sense, or is this um, okay? Okay. Um, so that um, I, 
even even though you 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 take a very broad perspective, I would still take an even broader perspective and look at what it means to be a woman versus what it means to be not a woman but something else in contemporary late stage capitalism and then and then infuse this debate with all this knowledge that we have from from feminism okay that's a very good point so as i was listening to you something uh, came to to my mind as i mentioned earlier so i don't know what you think but i, I really would love your feedback uh, i mentioned earlier um um, race critical theory and so uh, it came to my mind as Tamash was talking that uh, an example that uh, Crenshaw uh, was kind of one of the key uh, scholars in the fields of critical race theory back in the early um, 1980s uh, um, offered an example um, of kind of complex uh, uh, subjectivities so he um, he talked about uh, uh, black women uh, that sometimes experience discrimination uh, varies in a way that is very similar to white women experiences, but sometimes uh, their experience uh, is very similar to the experience of black men. So you have already two intersecting uh, conversations here. So sometimes uh, um, he argued uh, we could have uh, um, double discrimination so the combined almost the combined effect i'm kind of paraphrasing so not exactly what he said is the combined effect of uh, practices which discriminate on the basis of race and on the basis of gender for instance but sometimes there is also um in in the example of black women for instance uh, the experience of discrimination discrimination which is peculiar that is particular to um to black women. So it's not just uh, uh, being a woman or being uh, of that particular ethnicity. There is something else. There is something more, there is something specific. So there are different layers of discrimination, uh, uh, multiple discriminations that many scholars uh, in the field have described. Uh, um, as this combination of identities uh, are uh, the perfect uh, uh, grounds for uh, discrimination and criminalization. So almost what I have tried to do, it may be in a convoluted way, but I hope that has been clear enough, is kind of showing you what is the ground, the territory, the area the, where a criminalization uh, um, of key population blossoms. Because of this, because of what I have said, and now I'm really turning into a proper, a proper critical criminologist, the process of criminalization always produce, produces some suitable enemies. This is not something that I, I came up with. It's something that is at the core of uh, critical criminology. Um, a criminologist called Niels Christie, uh, already in again in 1986, if I remember correctly, spoke about uh, um, suitable enemies as the enemies of uh, the socio-economic order. Those were not produce enough for society. Uh, those who are uh, um, enemies of the the moral order. So think about the the label of key populations that I. Um, described earlier, listed earlier. So for instance, uh, take sex workers uh, as an example, take uh, uh, men who are having sex with men, uh, think about migrants and so forth. These are all enemies of the social order. So criminalization consequently becomes the best possible strategy to get rid of these suitable enemies. Keep in mind that suitable enemies uh, slightly change over over time but fundamentally those who are uh, uh, targeted and labeled as vulnerable in society are those who are the most suitable enemies am i making sense excellent totally okay thank you i cannot see all of you but the the kind ones that they're kind of nodding uh, gives me a sense of confidence that i can move on 
Now, the effect of criminalization on key population at increased risk of um, HIV, FC, and TB are uh, endless. And we could have hours and hours uh, simply describing the effect in many details. So um, I have provided you here with uh, a, a visual, which I hope will help us framing further um, this conversation. They're listed here in no particular order, but I want to start from one that is particularly close to, I suppose, the bulk of my academic work, which is uh, vulnerability to violence. Key populations, vulnerable population, are more vulnerable to violence. So when we transfer this concept and this lived experience being more vulnerable to violence, then it's very easy for us to understand our vulnerability to violence, for instance, for young girls and women, but also from young boys and, uh, and men can easily uh, become vulnerability to HIV and other bloodborne viruses can be can become easily vulnerability to to violence when it comes to sharing uh, the experience of living with HIV and so forth. Which brings me to uh, talk about, very briefly, about isolation and self-stigma. Without going into many details, because we have plenty of knowledge and in some instances also lived experience and personal experience of self-stigma and, uh, and isolation, certainly as a woman living with HIV, I have uh, academic knowledge of self-stigma, but also have plenty of personal experience of self-stigma. Society helped me greatly to acquire knowledge of self-stigma. Which brings me to talk about impact on public health policies at a broad level, but also impact on practices when it comes to um, public health. So the effect of criminalization um, are massive, on a personal level, again, think about isolation, self-stigma, vulnerability to violence, but also on a much broader level. So our responsibility as uh, um, our ask, uh, almost as our moral responsibility as um, advocates and activists, um, and those who are uh, working in the field, uh, is very much to make sure that the effects of criminalization don't spill over and over into too many populations. What is happening today um, is not different from what was happening uh, many years ago in terms of experience of stigma, isolation, so forth. The difference is that, as I said already, we know about this. We know we have plenty of data already which are able to support uh, this visual that you have in front of you. I think because I'm a woman living with HIV, but also because I'm a woman and because I'm a feminist academic, I think I want to consider um, my conversation about criminalization through a gender lens. But what I said earlier already about the experience of uh, violence, for instance, but also uh, often women have argued and will still argue that HIV criminalization, for instance, is uh, an instrument, is a tool of power which uh, hinder methods of HIV prevention among women and young girls, for instance. Now, I have, uh, um, I want to pause here and see if there are questions before I subject you to a, a series of slides which are much more technical. So I'm going to go back to one slide and leave it to the gender lens. My glasses don't allow me to do much. Okay, so is there any question, any comment, any clarification that you need so far? I'm mindful that I had said that we we're gonna have question and answers almost pit stop at this stage. I'm also mindful of, uh, of time. So rather than 10 minutes, I because I'm in charge, I can allow for five, but it would be good to have some feedback from you, but both in terms of what is what you think so far, and if there's anything that I haven't explained very clearly that you would like to, I don't know, maybe you'd like me to clarify. I'm gonna be the, the teacher who is uh, running a seminar I used to tell my students that it was really bad when uh, there, was, there was no reaction because that would mean that they agreed with me. And then uh, I would be quite nasty and ask direct questions. It's not what I'm gonna do now. 
But um, shall I move on to the next stage of the conversation then? Yeah. And subjecting you to a series of technical slides. You ready for this? Okay. Um, yeah, I guess what I wanted to ask Nicola before you go ahead was just, and I probably are coming to this, so maybe I'll not preempt it. You were just um, trying to understand um, sort of an overview, whether you have some um, uh, information, or probably this might come as the links at the end or something. So I'll wait, but my, I was quite interested in kind of understanding the landscape of criminalization across the board, especially in countries where you have experience or where you've worked. You know, just to kind of have a feel about it, because obviously different um, countries are dealing with different issues. There are different uh, legal frameworks in different countries. So I'll probably be a bit patient and ask my question at the end. But that's really my my, my thinking or just something around that. Well, thank you because in a way you're just beautifully introducing the next set of slides, which are more. Um, so this so far was really a kind of. Uh, um, the introduction to criminalization set in uh, the, sort of the theoretical scene in a very broad general sense because of uh, time constraint. Then what I have uh, um, for you is a series of slides which um, simply because of time constraint, I won't be able, but I can start now. Um, so the, the, the following set of slides are more technical because they are related to data and the data uh, as um, Dennis was entering are very much about uh, um, numbers. So we're moving to a theoretical perspective to a more kind of uh, statistical way of reading uh, the same reality. Um, and this is, for instance, what I'm going to discuss in a second is the distribution of new HIV infection um, amongst adults in Eastern Europe and Central Asia. So there will be then subsequently a list of countries, and this is very much linked to uh, criminalization. My idea um, when I have chosen those slides is really to go through these slides quite quickly to then give you a uh, time to move on and spend as much time as possible to discuss the two case studies that I have for you, which in my mind will generate, I hope, some uh, conversation. But um, I'm also not sure how well, because uh, uh, that's the biggest I can. Um, so for instance, I can really see very well what is written uh, um, at the end uh, here of the slides. So I don't know if it's better for you on your screen. But I can, um, rather than reading the slides, I'm going to move to the next one, which I don't know if you're able to read uh, um, better than I can. But this is very much uh, answering Dennis's uh, question, uh, which is about country with uh, um, laws which are very much punitive uh, and um, mm, clearly that discriminate. We can spend time uh, um, reading the slides or um, we can move on to the next, uh, the next set of slides. For instance, what you can see visually without going into too many details immediately. Um, so the red means uh, yes, when it comes to here, for instance, criminalization of any aspect of sex work. Again, we could have hours of discussion about why is sex work criminalized, and you're all very knowledgeable um, colleagues who have uh, probably undertaken uh, lots of conversations uh, on uh, on this topic in particular. Um, and as activists and advocates, surely there are many, many viewpoints which will uh, uh, take us to agree, I imagine, that we should not criminalize sex work. So. Going back to this uh, to these slides, take this slide to what I said earlier um, as a kind of introduction when I was introducing the notion, the idea, and uh, the fact that criminalization is. So we have the knowledge, uh, we know that criminalization actually of sex work in particular, if this is got our attention, is not working. So why do member states or states uh, 
in uh, Eastern Europe and Central Asia do criminalize sex work. There are so many answers to this uh, very broad question. And clearly, um, as I said, time is my, my worst enemy in this instance. My PhD, this, my PhD thesis was uh, on, uh, on the sex industry, was in particular on how HIV has changed the relationship between uh, outdoor sex workers uh, and uh, police officers. And it was obviously linked to criminalization, but was in, in a particular setting where actually uh, in, uh, in the red light area where criminalization of sex work did not exist, but it, it did exist outside this confinement. And I've learned many things uh, um, doing this uh, piece of research, which I particularly loved. But one thing that I learned, which stayed with me, my PhD, I mean, I literally completed my PhD last century. So clearly it's historical in so many ways. But what I have learned is that there is always, always, no matter how much you have in front of you in terms of data, in terms of information, in terms of rationale, there is always the political will to punish those who are not within uh, the framework that I, um, I highlighted very briefly and very broadly earlier in this conversation. This is not a very scientific uh, explanation. There are so many different ways in which I can, for instance, explain uh, how this is in red, which is uh, upsetting in so many ways, politically and morally, is wrong for so many different reasons. What is also wrong, and I, I find it incredibly, incredibly challenging to understand why today we still criminalize people who use drugs. Look at this slide here. I remember one of my first, now again, you know, I'm also disclosing quite a lot about myself considering, you know, my old age. So in really the early days of my uh, academic work, most of the work I've done was with people who were using drugs um, and they were incarcerated. So my work was in, uh, in prison. And what was shocking then, so I'm talking about the 1980s, um, it's not different from what I, I used to find uh, last time I did some work in prison, which was uh, literally before I started working for the ATG eight months ago, that drug drugs is something that, without sounding judgmental or from the moral majority, in one way or another, all of us have been using drugs or something that enhance our ability to, to function probably to make it better, to make us uh, more functioning, whatever. I'm not judging, just describing. So I cannot understand why people who are using drugs are uh, always criminalized and punished because they're not bad people. They're just at the receiving end of bad laws. And I leave it with you because this is uh, across countries. It's not just specific to one country. It's really every single country <coughs> to a less or greater extent, they do criminalize uh, vulnerable populations, they do criminalize uh, key populations, with the outcome that we all know already, increased risk of uh, HIV, EPC, TB, and uh, blood-borne viruses, and so forth. Again, I hope you can uh, read. Uh, this is really... Um, then it says um, paradise because there is a list of uh, countries listed uh, and uh, mm, so key population listed. So again, I'm staying with sex workers uh, and you can see, again, you can indulge yourself uh, with these slides later. You can see, I don't know if that is possible. So I'm doing something that, yeah, I knew I couldn't do it. Right, so don't trust me with technology. You can play with the slides. Again, have a look at this. People living with HIV who are on treatment, total population, women, men, and children. I'm going quite fast, simply because I'm mindful of time. 
distribution of people living with HIV uh, according to uh, knowledge. I think this, again, is a conversation that is very much linked to talking about uh, key populations uh, at risk uh, of contracting FC, HIV, and TB, and any other blood-borne viruses, because knowledge of uh, um, here is called knowledge of status, but I'm referring to uh, also knowledge about potentially being uh, in a position of acquiring HIV, TB, and so forth. There is so much work that we still need to do. And this is the beginning, of course. Again, for Dennis's uh, uh, pleasure, it's quite difficult to read this uh, slide, I think, unless you can make it as large as possible. But take uh, one country in uh, alphabetical order. I'm just choosing Albania as an example. And I'm focusing on transgender population and transgender communities. I don't know if you can read everything because it's quite small on my screen, but I have a... Um... And then if you scroll down, as I'm trying to do, the numbers are increasing. So my question to you, and I really would like an answer, or at least uh, generate some sort of conversation. Remember what I said earlier about uh, criminalization has a kind of almost a site of uh, exercising power. And uh, why do you think that if my definition and the production of suitable enemies and everything, you kind of implicitly agree with me because you didn't disagree, um, why is this that uh, in these countries listed here, Albania, Armenia, Belarus, Bosnia, and so, and so, Zepistan, all of them here, we see that there is a, a great exercise of uh, power in terms of criminalization. Is it because these countries listed here have a specific type of government? So are we blaming politics? Or are we blaming or making responsible something else or someone else? I'm leaving this question open. Oh, Dennis. Uh, well, I would probably say that it's a bit of both in terms of um, religion as a role to play, probably. Uh, and also, I think, as part of um, former Soviet, at least for some of them, um, former Soviet uh, um, um, Union uh, countries, there might be some, uh, I mean, l l less liberal laws than than there may be in the Western world. I don't know, just, uh, just a thought about this. I don't know whether it's correct, but I, I would probably attribute it to both religion and politics. Thank you. Uh, Tamas? Actually, I pretty much wanted to say the same thing, but perhaps framed a little differently. Um, yes, I fully agree with, with Dennis that these are post-Soviet countries or mostly belonging to that sphere of influence. And if you look at um, if you look at the ideological background or foundations of um, of the Soviet Union, so sorry, sorry about the microphone. Uh, so the um, um, if you like the key tenets of um, of uh, real real existing communism, so not ideal communism, but real existing communism as it was implemented in the Soviet Union. That's a very conservative ideology. So that, that doesn't leave much space for, you know, individual freedoms. Uh, individual freedom, it's a communal uh, ideology. Individual freedoms are not um, not acknowledged or, or respected. And all of that is then also underpinned, which which we see. I mean, see, we see the consequences of that today, is underpinned by an ultra conservative, um, orthodox Christian, religious uh, background or or underpinning. Um, or in some of these places, um, uh, comes to that uh, an equally uh, orthodox and um, and conservative Muslim. I, 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 religious ideology. So I think that this is, I, I don't think that we can tease these factors apart, as Dennis also suggests. It all belongs together. It it forms a package and it leads to 
to um, to more authoritarian inclinations and tendencies in these these parts of the world. Thank you, thank you both. But could we also say, um, and implicitly agree with me, that what I said earlier about the production of the suitable enemies, this is just a um, a kind of a statistical um, kind of proof, evidence, if you like. So numbers are telling. Uh, telling me, or the way in which I read these numbers, is really to support uh, the claim I made earlier, that in society, unless uh, there is someone that is uh, suitable to the functioning of society, um, they are, because as uh, Tamash uh, rightly pointed out, this is not just about uh, uh, one type of government or political, it's really you know, whether they're conservative, they're um, totalitarian, whether there is a kind of moral majority. Um, I I think that the production of the suitable enemies fits really well what we are seeing in terms of uh, discrimination and criminalization of uh, key populations. Those are populations who are not deemed to be suitable for the functioning of uh, society. Think about, uh, um, now I'm talking about Italy because I'm particularly a shade of the Italian in this instance. Um, the way in which Italian government uh, has been dealing recently with migrant population is uh, beyond belief. Uh, moving uh, migrants to, literally speaking, uh, um, detention centers to another country, Albania, in particular, is um, is beyond belief in terms of violation of so many human rights that um, it's just yeah baffling. How can people come up with uh, these ideas? But the notion underneath this, you can say this is uh, you know the outcome of a very conservative right wing government, but um, the right wing conservative government is such. Also because the migrants in this instance, but we can talk about sex workers, we can talk about uh, people who are using drugs and so forth, are not producing what the state needs them to produce. They are perceived as a cost rather than an asset. That's what I think anyway, but I'm open to challenge. Tamaj? Uh, I don't want to challenge this. I, I I want to maybe add to this that dialectically they do produce, these populations do produce something and they produce mm -hmm. a solid, um, a, they produce a solid um, image of the enemy, which is, um, which is in this, as you also suggest, they are, they are suitable enemies. Um, so they, they do um, um, by uh, taking on this, these these projections that are based on moral uh, and political judgment, they do uh, provide that uh, delineation uh, between them and us uh, in a in a in a binary structure that repeats actually does repeat the binary of the patriarchy um, that will that allows the system to reproduce itself. Um, to 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 showcase to the people, the nation, the folk, that there is a, there is a tangible enemy. There is a, there is a need for security. There's a need for protection, and I do believe that this is a contribution, even if involuntarily. But this is a contribution yeah. by by. Uh, these oppressed populations, and it's actually very interesting to see, as you say, what uh, what happens in Italy with the concentration camps being set up in other. Sorry, I just used the word that I didn't want to use, but anyway, so the refugee camp or whatever they are called, internment camps, or but <laughs> in in Albania, um, it's um, because we've seen this because we've seen this before, but we've but what we've not really seen is this this bluntness this uh this obviousness of of um of um excising a part of uh, of the people from from the country and expelling them um like um 
like the scapegoat into the desert. <laughs> so I, I, I find this highly symbolic. I'm sorry, I'm rambling. So I stop here. No, 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 but it's true. But then, uh, I mean, uh, um, it's not unique to, to Italy. Think about the UK thinking of sending uh, migrants to Rwanda, which again is significant where, you know, uh, those uh, um, who perceive themselves as very powerful, they then exploit those who are less powerful, financially speaking, uh, for instance. And um, so there is uh, always uh, a kind of uh, synergy whereby um, there is exploitation on so many different levels, but I'm stating the very obvious here. Right. Again, we can uh, continue with uh, reading uh, the same. So this is kind of the same argumentation. Uh, and I want to move to this. I want to move to this because then I hope we can uh, have some, some conversation. I want to offer you two case studies. And on purpose, I've chosen two case studies, which I hope will provoke a discussion. When we think about uh, um, criminalization of, in this instance, key populations, we always think about the alternative to criminalization. So the two most obvious case studies for me would be one, uh, the movement, uh, the ideology that supports defund the police uh, approach. And the other one is penal abolitionism. So in reality, if we don't have the police, then people won't get arrested for what they do or if we don't have a, um, a system which puts everyone in prison, then uh, we will stop criminalizing everyone for what they do. Because remember that these systems uh, uh, do not criminalize people for what they do, most of the case, but for who they are, think about migrants. They're not criminalized because they actually do something, but they're criminalized because of who they, who they are. So we keep talking about, you know, key populations. Uh, and we have decided that we agreed that in public health is useful to use this label, which I would challenge because the moment uh, in which you label some someone with something, then you put them uh, uh, in a situation in which they're less powerful than you are. But that's, um, yeah, that's another conversation again to have, which I'm happy to have. So the first case study that I'm going to um, share with you is defund the police once I can move to the next slide. And why I've chosen defund the police? Because, well, because I don't like the police and what they do. I don't like what they stand for. Uh, you know, this is recorded, but I'm, I'm happy to stand behind um, my belief. But also because as a criminologist uh, and a professor in criminology and policing, I have studied the police long enough to know that their practices uh, have directly and indirectly, and I will give you examples in a minute, directly and directly affected uh, um, key populations which have been put at an even greater risk of acquiring uh, HIV, EPC, TB. If populations are vulnerable by definition, again, I'm referring to what I said about power, they're already in a situation which they need support, protection, help, whatever the perspective you want to use, care. So if you criminalize them and you punish them because of who they are, not because of what they do, then you're putting this population even in a greater vulnerable situation. This happens constantly. The way in which the police, uh, um, I say this with incredible confidence and almost arrogance because I've studied this for many, many years, Police violence against key populations, uh, against vulnerable population, is, is vile and it's so widespread that um, we don't need many statistical data um, to support my claim that um, police uses violence specifically against those who are not able to defend themselves. But also, historically, and not historically, police confiscating condoms, uh, needles, and drugs paraphernalia, they have been responsible, directly responsible, for uh, the epidemic that uh, made uh, 
Edinburgh in the 1980s to be labeled as the eighth capital of Europe. Police officers were confiscating needles, so they believed drug, drug users would not use drugs because they didn't have any equipment to share to, to inject drugs, with the outcome that clearly people would still inject drugs, but they would share needles. This was the, the policy and the practice that was written in policy in, in, in Scotland in the 1980s. But something similar happened in so many countries. It was difficult to, to for young people, I'm not even talking about Italy, um, because that would be quite obvious. It was you know, difficult for, for young people to, and for gay men uh, even more so, to have uh, access to condoms. Police until recently, and the until recently is last year, and I can say this with confidence because I've done a lot of research on this, would mark uh, people who are uh, using drugs as potential HIV status. They would label as uh, dangerous uh, individuals who have been using drugs or they've been uh, um, clients of sex workers. The HIV status on database uh, triggers a series of, uh, um, of action and behavior from police officers, which are uh, against uh, any basic human rights. So the violation of human rights here is uh, incredible and is staggering. The same with mandatory testing upon arrest. In many cases, uh, people who have been arrested have been forced to have a, um, a test for EPSI HIV. Uh, without their consent. I'm just telling you this uh, in the same way in which, again, I can say this because that was part of my research for many years and one of my PhD students did an amazing piece of work on this. Police officers would confiscate medications, uh, antiretroviral drugs, very often were confiscated by police officers for no particular reason. Violence against sex workers, LGBTQI communities, migrants, and so forth are never taken seriously by the police. Again, I can say this uh, with confidence and arrogance because I've done enough research and I work with, uh, with many um, victims uh, of um, violence. I can also say and share that I worked, uh, um, that was my last job really, I work with a major police force uh, in uh, in the UK who was under special measure. And in UK, police forces are under special measures when they are uh, not behaving according to some standards that are set by the College of Policing and the government. Uh, and the standards that they were not, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> um, reaching was uh, the way in which this big police force, big as wide, one of the biggest in the UK, was dealing with victims of crime. So they were purposely neglecting reports from uh, uh, sex workers, uh, LGBTQI communities, um, when they were um, reporting violence by clients, by members of the public and so forth. Having said that, I'm proposing in, in a very provocative way the argument to counteract criminalization of behavior by suggesting that we could start thinking about defunding the police. Now, defund the police is, uh, as you probably know, is an ideology almost, which stems from uh, uh, the US via the Black Lives Matter. It came to the UK and everything that comes from the US to the UK, now I'm very uh, sarcastic and critical, but in, uh, in my field of expertise happens many times. The same thing happened with privatizing prisons. So sometimes uh, in the UK, they think that uh, a good idea, in inverted commas, from the US can be applied as a, you know, verbatim to a different uh, social and legal context. And that will happen with Black Lives Matter to the UK, in particularly when it came to talk about defunding the police, because the police in the US and the UK as well have been identified as the key perpetrators of violence against ethnic minorities and black African communities, which is a fact. 
So this was an opportunity to start thinking about defunding the police as a movement, as an ideology, to start thinking about challenging uh, um, law enforcement agencies uh, um, in the UK first and in many other European uh, countries. Although I have to say that in many European countries, this is difficult uh, to challenge. Uh, you can challenge this ideo ideologically, but in practical terms, it's much more difficult because of the structure of the police. Think about, again, I'm referring to Italy. Um, in Italy, there are different uh, police forces uh, almost uh, embedded into each other. And it would be very difficult to start promoting, um, unless you want to be very provocative, which I would welcome very much, the idea of defunding the police. Defunding the police also, paradoxically, uh, because of uh, narratives about power that I described earlier, has been uh, um, stolen almost uh, by the, the right and the far right. So the, um, the narratives of defunding the police, which was the police uh, is too expensive, we can find, that's a far right talking, we can fund our own private police and we can get rid of uh, key population. We can get rid easily of migrants, we can get rid of uh, sex workers uh, um, and so forth. And this happens uh, in uh, many cities in many countries. Okay, my question. Would you find the police approach uh, be the answer to tackle criminalization of key population? If we get, if we take some money away from the police and we put money into prevention, think about, you know, we spend a lot of money on policing, let's spend less money on policing, we can take that money and think about prevention, think about PrEP as an example. Rather than sending migrants to Albania or to Rwanda or whatever, can we not find ways in which actually they can be embedded in the place where they want to live? And then some financial resources can be diverted there and so forth. Any idea so I can drink some water? That is? This is just my personal opinion. Uh, it's probably I'm not an expert in policing or uh, the legal framework, but I'm 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 kind of thinking that I mean the first question of obviously would ask is um, what kind of areas of policing is relevant, especially in terms of experiences of of marginalized or community communities that are criminalized, and in that sense, you there might be an argument to do, to to defend uh, uh, the police in those contexts, but I just think that um. The whole idea, and I have to say, it's been hijacked by the far right uh, in terms of, of 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 the narratives around it. And I just think it doesn't do advocates any good to talk about defunding the police because obviously they will hijack it, they will misrepresent it, and it's not practical in a way. So I think that the issue in America was very strong because of the Black Lives Matter movement. You know, for, let me say like. Um, the whole thing around uh, fighting for equal rights and uh, from America in a, in for a very long time, there has been an issue there, obviously, because of the killings of black people, disproportionate number of black people being shot and killed. And so maybe there's some kind of uh, relevance to it in America, or there's an argument for it in America in some instances, as opposed to Europe. I think for me, what I would say uh, personally, I think it's more about reforming policing. And I think that has really got a lot to do with how the police uh, treat, uh, as, uh, I mean, the whole culture around racism and, 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 and violence within the police systems in America. But I think in Europe, it is more about reforming laws and not actually defining the police, it's more about reforming laws that criminalize. And, uh, and, and so the enforcement around this should be in tandem with the reforms of those laws so that people who are being criminalized like sex workers or who use drugs are not are not are not criminalized so i would say that is more about reforming as opposed to defining thank you and who should do the the reforming of the police should be the government should be as citizens asking uh, should be how does it happen uh, in uh, in practical terms because 
I, th I think reforms in, 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 in terms of the, like America, they have got the police, you know, it's like independent police in very in, in states and they have got different kind of levels of police. And I think I think reforming police depends on the structures and the systems. In the UK, for example, we've got the police, if, like different police in different regions, Metropolitan Police, West Humberside Police. I think it's more about a, 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 not a top-down kind of thing. I think there has to be civil participation and there has to be room for people to civilly, I mean, to, to civically uh, participate in that. Uh, and especially in America where they do elections for sheriffs, maybe it has to do with somebody's uh, kind of reputation. How can I say uh, what they are campaigning about, what they are going to do for the police and for the citizens? Thank you. Tanash? I, I mean, I hear, I can hear myself when I say this, but I think that the reform of the police should be the task of a parliament. That's what parliaments are there for. I know that they don't work, but that's, that's ideally, that's what should happen. So it's not the government, it's the parliaments that should do that. Thank on you. Be, on behalf of the people. Anyone else, or shall I move on to, um, yeah, to the other case study? I think I should, because I'm mindful of time. I don't know why I can't. Why am I not able to? Okay. My other suggestion for a case study and to generate some conversations that, uh, okay, we agree that uh, we don't want to defund the police, so we want, uh, we still want the police and we want to <clears throat> better police, better educated police. But what about if, uh, because we're thinking about, we're talking about criminalization, so rather than um, changing uh, the police, so we are still allowing police officers uh, to to do what they do for the time being, but maybe we could think about uh, uh, not incarcerating everyone. We can start thinking about ways in which uh, um, we can abolish, at least, uh, imprisonment. Keep in mind that the majority of uh, people in prison, in any um, in any country that you can think of, are. People of color, homeless people, people at the margin of society, people who have been using drugs, they're not those who have committed, uh, I mean, in some instances, but um, they have committed major crimes. The majority of, uh, think about the UK, think about Italy, think about any other um country in Europe, the majority of people inhabiting uh, um, our detention centers are people who can happily be living in uh, society because they're not a threat to society. A person who injects drugs is not a threat to society. Someone who has committed uh, multiple fraud is a threat to society, but most of the time, now I'm speaking about Italy in particular, but it's not the the only country. They they can, uh, you know, they're not detained in prison. They have maybe house arrest or other alternatives to incarceration. So that's why I thought about penal abolitionism as another case study to see if we can maybe start thinking about uh, at least alternatives to incarceration because ultimately the key populations um, that um, we spoke about earlier those were labeled as key populations, are those who are most criminalized, as I said many times, because of who they are, not because of what they do. Some of the, I mean, there are very many, many more reasons for supporting penal abolitionism. Um, and maybe I should say as a disclaimer that um, as well as, uh, you know, self-identifying myself as a critical criminologist, I'm also a penal abolitionist, which means that I would always find an alternative to incarceration. And I think there are very many. The, the main reason that any criminologist in the world would agree with me is that um, the penal system as it is in any single country that you can uh, choose from doesn't work. 
it doesn't work because uh, um, what would be the effect of uh, incarceration? Put someone, uh, think about key populations, put them aside for a while, and then what do you do with them? Are that you incarcerate them for the rest of their physical life, or you have to do something with this population? But if you don't change, as Dennis was suggesting, if you don't change the, the system, not much can be done. Prisons are also very expensive. They're incredibly expensive to run, despite the fact that those who are in prison most of the time don't benefit from the high cost of the prison in terms of the running of the prison. Even those who live uh, um, unincarcerated, rather, in private prisons. So some of the money, the argument would be, can be transferred from, rather than building more prisons, into public health initiatives or in education, which will then allow um, key populations to be less stigmatized and criminalized. There is so much evidence, and I don't need to tell you, um, colleagues, uh, of violation of human rights and civil liberties in prison, in the same way in which there is plenty of evidence when it comes to dealing with the police and key populations. Other reasons, I think that um, any criminologist would tell you that once someone approaches prison, then there is almost this revolving door because you're labeled as a criminal, by the simple fact that you enter prison and you are a prisoner for X amount of time, then there is this sort of self-fulfilling prophecy. It's very difficult then to become someone else. And key populations in particular are double stigmatized because they're already vulnerable when they enter prison. When I think about prisons, I also think about uh, specifically with reference to migrant population, uh, but also facilities for those in some countries who are using drugs and not allowed to use drugs. So I'm thinking also about migration detention center, but uh, all these centers, um, these places, these physical locations are really um, almost a stereotypical locus for uh, transmission and acquisition of uh, HIV, EPC, any bloodborne virus and TB. So it's a, these centers of detention are a contradiction in terms. If we think about key populations and we want to address the issue by providing them with uh, um, opportunities for uh, not being uh, uh, at risk of acquisition and transmission, then uh, surely we shouldn't put them in a physical location where transmission is much more probable. Also think about the fact that those who are already living with HIV or FC or TB, in many detention centers, in many migration detention settings, do not have access to antiretroviral drugs and testing and everything else in the same way in which they would have if they were not incarcerated or in a physical location. Not to mention the um, and again, I'm talking uh, from the perspective of someone who has worked um, trying to train uh, um, prison staff to understand what it is to live with HIV with not much success, I have to say. Discrimination, stigmatization, uh, and uh, violence, uh, physical and psychological violence are very much uh, um, widespread in uh, detention centers, whether it's migration centers or, and I also want to add that minors uh, who are amongst the key populations are very often detained for no other reason that society doesn't know what to do with them. But that is not because they're a threat to society. This is a lack of knowledge and understanding. Uh, I want to add empathy and compassion. Okay. If I think more specifically and more in detail about key populations and the effect on penal abolitionism, there is a financial rationale, as I said already. Resources can be devolved uh, very easily elsewhere rather than uh, in detention center. The focus should and must be on education. Education of key players of key stakeholders. So I'm thinking about prison staff, I'm thinking about those who are involved in running, whatever that means, um, migration centers, but also education in a much broader sense. 
there is, as I said, uh, um, the rationale when it comes to human rights violation. There should be no harm to populations who are already vulnerable, but that is not the case. Human rights violation is really widespread. And uh, yes, we could uh, go for um, for the option, the rational option that is, well, if these people have committed uh, um, a criminal offence by the simple fact that they enter allegedly illegal, illegally a country or because they are men having sex with men in a country where the law doesn't allow them to do so, then clearly um, the state, citizens would argue that the, the state has the right to punish them. I would argue the opposite. But also I would argue that uh, because this is a violation of uh, individuals' human rights, this would have stigma and discrimination to the experience that vulnerable population already have. And then uh, clearly, uh, I don't need to tell you, esteemed colleagues, that uh, there is a public health rationale for penal abolitionists because access to health and social care should be for all, should be for everyone. So at one point, what I really would like to do, if I meet with you again in a year or so from now, is that we're not talking anymore about key populations because everyone will have the same access to health care. There will be no discrimination. I know that sounds really a fantastic option and a dream. But if we think about targeted intervention now, then we can start thinking about, uh, you know, what are now labeled as key population as part of our community, rather than uh, uh, focusing. And I, I know I understand the rationale for focusing on specific populations, but all of us, we are vulnerable. We are in one way or another part of a key population for what I said earlier about sex, gender, and class. Okay, I'm almost at the end of my conversation with you. I think that this current model not only supports, but almost uh, um, highlights racist, misogyny, and homophobic uh, behavior and practices uh, and xenophobic practices uh, as the standard, as the norm, as what is in reality in society and allows and forces us almost to find uh, little alternatives to protect ourselves when in reality, we should be able to say, no, this is not right. Because key and vulnerable population have still no access to testing in prison. In many, 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 and I stress many, the majority, I know for some work I recently done in the UK, but I know for work I've done previously in other um, countries in Europe. Not every single um, prison establishment offers access to testing, not to mention counseling and support. Often still uh, there is, uh, um, now I'm referring to violence against women uh, and young girls. Women in some countries, when they enter detention centers or prison settings, they're psychologically forced to have an abortion if they're pregnant, for instance. There is a, a, a widespread denial of uh, human rights at every single level for every single key population that we have mentioned. And the policing of sexualities, which is something I haven't addressed much uh, in this conversation with you today, is still widespread. Men having sex with men is not still in 2024 something that society as a whole in many European countries uh, or in Central Asia and, uh, deems as acceptable. There are still conversations behind this, which means to me that there is still stigma discrimination uh, attached to this. There is denial of free movement, uh, and I'm referring, um, well, I'm referring to migrant population, but also um, I remember how it felt when as a woman living with HIV, I couldn't go to some countries like such as the US, for instance. I still go, I still did go, but um, I was a kind of criminal, for instance. Denial of free movement is very important when it comes to key populations. And then obviously there are uh, 
consequences, and the consequences are uh, not attention in care, um, delay access to care, or no access at all, and stigma and discrimination. In some instances, there is also death because people do not want to access a system that is deemed and experienced as <laughs> stigmatizing and discriminatory. There is evidence based on data. As a social scientist, uh, you know, I can support everything I have said with plenty of data, but we all know this. Criminalizing the use, possession for personal use uh, of uh, drugs doesn't help at all society. There is no evidence whatsoever that putting people in prison from key populations, whether they're migrants, whether uh, people who are using drugs or sex works helps. It doesn't help at all. If these are populations which are deemed problematic, these are the catalysts of what society deems as a problem, incarcerating them doesn't help at all. It simply puts physically them away for X amount of time from society's view, nothing else. But the consequences of that nothing else are massive. I don't need to explain this to you because we're very knowledgeable, but I wanted to have a visual again to remind ourselves how criminalization of key population, <laughs> excuse me, is embedded in stigmatization of behavior and discrimination. This was supposed to be a circle. It doesn't look very much like a circle. But they're all embedded into one another. The point I made earlier, I'm repeating is, this is about uh, uh, exercising power on those who are vulnerable. Nothing more, nothing less. Similar question to the previous one. Would penal abolitionists be the answer to tackle criminalization of key populations? In some instances, I would argue strongly for a yes. Not always. We cannot abolish prisons at all, completely, I don't think. In some instances, we need a, a physical place. But in most instances, we can do without prisons. We can find alternatives to incarceration, which are much more beneficial to society and are much more beneficial to those who are the receiving ends of incarceration. Any comments? Okay. I do agree. Thank you. I'm particularly passionate about abolitionism, as you can gather, probably. But I think it makes sense. So when we talk about criminalization of key population, think, visualize the fact that we can, rather than putting them more at risk of uh, HIV, TB, TB, for instance, TB in prison is so widespread that is mind blowing to learn that in most penal institutions in Europe and Central Asia, there are no initiatives to tackle, there's not even information about TB. Okay, now this is the best bit, I think. I've given you all these massive, massive uh, backgrounds of information. Now it's about us, community. Now it's about us, and there's the alchemy of collaboration as I call it. So, as community, who, and now I really need an answer for, from you. This is uh, very much an interactive workshop. Who should start? Should we, we, at the outside of, for instance, a prison institution or a migration detention center, should we be the ones who start first? to talk about this? Or should we allow those who are uh, experiencing incarceration, for instance, or vulnerabilities, should we allow a safe space for them? How? And I'm giving already the answer when we should do it now because it's, uh, you know, data are showing us that there is uh, a widespread increased risk for key population to be at the receiving ends of uh, bloodborne viruses, uh, TB and so forth. So the, the when is now, that's the only answer I know for sure. We shouldn't really indulge much longer, but the who and how, I'll leave it to, to you. 
how shall we do this? What is the alchemy of collaboration that we can think of? Because otherwise we're gonna put key populations out there and we communities, if we perceive ourselves as not from a key population, we just watch. What can we do? Or is there something that we can do? So I will start by saying that all of this is very scary. Um, but also it's a, it's, it seems to be a very daunting task. Um, but also to some extent we have been, um, uh, uh, our organizations, and this goes, I think, for for the biggest, for the bigger part of uh, not just core, but also of eight section Europe and the ATG and correlation and all the other networks and organizations that have been involved in our work for years. We've been doing this, even if there's not one specific project for um, uh, abolishing prisons or defunding or reforming the police. But this is something, these are, these are all issues that we have been working around and working towards uh, pretty much consistently. Um, at the same time, um, I um, kind of find it unjust that this is, that, that tasks like this, which are massive and affect the very core of how society is built up as you, as you, um, very um, succinctly uh, explained in the beginning. How can we change this being underfunded, tiny organizations dispersed across Europe? So this is, um, this. That, that's why I said it's scary because mm -hmm. I really don't know how you can. Uh, so, and I don't want to sound like, you know, um, like my grandmother who always said, well, this is not going to work anyway. That's not what I mean. Um, yeah. But it's, it's, it's doubting because and at the same time, we also have, um, we also have so much day-to-day uh, -day, um, trouble and work to do. Um, and most of us do this type of work as volunteers. So, and I, I increasingly, so this, actually ultimately radicalizes me and my and my friends and then we tend to say that the only solution is the revolution but i just i don't want to go then there, there. <laughs> it's just, it's, um, that's equally unrealistic but it's um yeah so there's because um, all these um symptoms that uh, that that you have described have one root cause and the root cause is how society functions today. How do we change that? Uh, thank you. Anyone else or shall I? Um, I, I agree. Um, and it's not that uh, suddenly we, we change the work we do um, the pace of the work we do, the quality of the work we do, um, and our commitment. Uh, um, what I was trying to do in a kind of provocative way is, well, it's actually two things. One is to kind of uh, remind uh, ourselves that uh, I think it's important that we don't, um, we keep talking about uh, vulnerable communities. Uh, we, we kind of dissect communities in so many different ways uh, and uh, at one level it's easy to talk about vulnerable and key populations because then you identify the specific group so you identify migrants you identify um you know i talk about women all the time you talk about aging uh, and hiv and everything that has to do with uh, uh, with what i'm most passionate about but what i was trying to to kind of say is actually the opposite i think that at one point rather than dissecting everyone into because of the intersecting vulnerabilities that i mentioned earlier each of us is made of uh, bits of key populations and therefore in our practice but i'm talking uh, 
about myself and to myself in a way. In my practice, I want to make sure that everyone is included, not as a token, but because everyone is really part of the key population, if that makes any sense. So the, the who um, and the, the how are, uh, for me, um, something that, we, as I said, we don't need to change what we're doing. Uh, we could uh, clearly have more uh, funding available. We can have more, uh, you know, communities, community members uh, involved in whatever we want to do. Everything can be much wider, much better, much. But fundamentally, this is just uh, awareness raising. This, this for me is important to say because we keep forgetting that uh, we're all part of these key populations, I think. And that's what I wanted really to, to kind of highlight. So the when is, as I said now, the who would be um, all of us for whatever tribe we identify with and how by being mindful that all these intersecting vulnerabilities, they make us who we are, but also they make others who they are. I don't know if that sounds too philosophical. And that's why, uh, and um, I can assure you that we are almost towards the end. I want us to, to think of, uh, yes, a community of people as we are already, but also a community of aims. What do we, so as a kind of self-reflecting, I know that later you will give some feedback on this conversation, but really, why do we need to learn more about key populations if then uh, we are not um, in a position to, to do something? And I'm not suggesting defund the police. I'm not suggesting penal abolitionists. I'm thinking of something that is more within the, the remit of who we are and what we do. So what is, um, and this is a question, uh, although there's not a question mark there, but uh, what is our ultimate aim when we talk about key populations? Do we want to talk about key populations in terms of uh, prevention? Uh, do we want to talk uh, about key populations in terms of uh, access to care, retention care? What would we want to prioritize when we think about key populations? Or do we want to be more radical? And uh, as I said earlier, not label someone as a key population, but think of all of us as part of key populations. This is a question, so I can drink some more water. Thank you. Okay. Thomas again. Um, sorry, I may, maybe I talk too much. Anyway, um, the um, I I also have a question to you all, um, and also to you, Nicoletta. Something that I've been thinking about for a while, and that resonates now or is evoked as you speak about strengthening the community and working together more. Uh, because there are new fault lines emerging um, in this community um, of, if you like, vulnerable people, and I fully agree with your point that all of us are a part, I mean, we are part of this community, that's not even a question, but what do we do with the abuse of intersectionality and the emergence of um, of the oppression Olympics? So what do we do when, um, when uh, say, lesbian communities speak out against trans people when gays don't want to spend time or don't want to accept community with trans folks uh, what about this all this splintering of uh, of communities uh, the the adding of uh, new and new uh, identities and labels to people's uh, to people's selves and identities so that's a, that's a trend that goes against what you what you suggest and what I fully agree with that should happen. It's very difficult to counter these these trends, and this clearly is actually an abuse of the original concepts of um, of intersectionality, as as uh, Crenshaw and uh, Bell Hooks and others described it um, 
uh, originally back in the 80s. So it becomes in the in the daily work, it, it becomes very challenging to keep together a community where everyone tries to define themselves as highly unique individuals, which is, again, a result of the pressure of society to be successful individuals, right? So individualism is um, one of the key tenets of, um, of late-stage capitalism. And so what, what, what is your suggestion? How do we, how do we tackle this, uh, this challenge in a, in a better way? Because so far we've not been very successful. Um, clearly, this is a very difficult question to answer, but I'll try my my best. Um, I think I, I totally agree with everything uh, you, you said, uh, and the fact that um, I mean it's true that each of us wants to assert their individuality. So I, you know, I'm claiming my space as a woman. Uh, who has been aging with HIV as uh, you know a migrant uh, to the UK uh, to what you know uh, whatever um, so clearly that is part of who I am and there are so many different layers so is you know I'm totally agree that is important to have a, but I repeat a safe space where I can assert myself um, but equally I'm mindful and that's the bit that I think often is missing I'm mindful that others are not less than me or better than me. So I embed my practice, whatever I do, uh, in the principle of equality, there is no one that is better than me. And if I practice uh, this, which is very kind of naive concept and idea, then I can argue with data that uh, because someone has been uh, has chosen or has been in a situation where they are using drugs, then they're not less important than me who has made, you know, a choice of not using drugs because I don't find that interesting for me. But it's not that it's bad or good or it's better or worse. It's just um, allowing people to have the freedom to be who they are. And I think that within our community, sometimes, this is difficult to achieve because there are layers of power. We are not immune to power and to exercise power even within our community. So if I'm thinking as a community, people living with HIV as in a broad sense as possible, there are layers of power for what I said earlier about intersecting vulnerabilities. But if I acknowledge that no one is uh, better than me and everyone does the same, then we can work together because there is an element which is very naive and is very kind of uh, socialist uh, embedded for a better word into this naive concept that together we are stronger, together we are a very powerful community. And we have demonstrated this in the past many, many times that we are very strong as a community, but we need to, to learn to, to acknowledge differences, not in terms of layers of inferiority or superiority but in terms of enriching each other and this is what is, mit is missing I think we are not learning from each other and I think this is what sometimes makes us a very fragmented community and that's why you know we have embraced the notion uh, that um, key populations uh, and uh, vulnerable populations uh, are clearly those who should have space in uh, in our practice, in our conversations, in the way in which we proactively um, put forward uh, actions and behaviors for a better society as a kind of very general terms. But fundamentally, we're not respecting uh, each other's uh, for who we are. I mean, it's a kind of simplistic observation, but... Um, you know, it's very easy for all of us to to list why we dislike people as opposed to list why we like them. And if you take this uh, to the level of uh, police officers uh, relating to key um, key populations, that's very easy to understand. You know, police officers, for reasons that 
um, we can dissect uh, in, an, in another setting. Um, these like uh, uh, sex workers because there is something triggering for them or because they do not represent uh, the ideal woman or for whatever reasons that, um, yeah, we can dis discuss whatever. But I think that fundamentally, sorry, I mumbled a lot, but fundamentally, I think that if we learn how to respect each other and acknowledge differences, then we are a much stronger community. As a kind of, it's quite simple in a way. It's the same principle that I would adopt when I want to learn uh, a foreign language. I have to, at one point, jump and start speaking that language. And that's the same, you know, it's a practice that uh, at one point we can uh, have intellectual conversations, but fundamentally, if we don't practice, it, practice, you know, compassion and empathy towards others within our community, then we're not moving forward. This is slightly digressing for conversation about key populations, but key populations seem to have no voice. The simple fact that I'm talking about key populations as uh, someone is not part of a key population already highlights the fact that it's us and them, which is not what I like. I am incredibly mindful of time. Um, so I'm kind of almost crying to Chris. Can I have uh, uh, five minutes more? Okay. Because I really wanted this to be interactive, but it didn't turn out to be interactive. I've been talking too much and I really want us to... to there is a, this slide is really to summarize decriminalization, uh, depenalization and uh, legalizing uh, some behaviors, but it's kind of a reminder, so I know what it is. Um, I want to kind of, con you know, complete this conversation, or at least put some sort of, um, I hope this will generate some more thinking amongst ourselves as a community, is a fact documented by science and data that um, key populations have no power, they have no ability whatsoever to negotiate a way out. And again, this is, I think, the work we do is fundamental. I have been uh, discussing um, overtly and on uh, some sort of political discourse that has to happen. But clearly, as citizens, we should put this forward. Also, I think it's important uh, that um, law enforcement uh, have to be law enforcement agencies, have to be part of the solution. So I'm not uh, supporting fully defunding the police, but I'm suggesting to involve the police, mainly as Dennis suggested, uh, from the very beginning of the conversation. So we need to do a piece of work as community, which is really educating uh, the police. Uh, we, we have perceived the police, rightly so, as antagonists, but we must educate them. So they have to understand the effect of uh, physical and psychological violence on, um, on key populations perpetrated by the police. They have to understand much better what they do when they beat up senseless sex workers because they're outside the red light zone, for instance. This is important. This is my, you know, in summary, my take home message. The other important take home message is very much about uh, the effect of criminalization. Criminalization is uh, almost the other side is of stigma and discrimination. They're so intertwined that when we talk about criminalization, decriminalizing uh, behaviors, we must take into consideration the effect of criminalization in terms of internalized stigma, but also in terms of stigma. Everyone, as said earlier, has been uh, um, in prison or in a migration detention center, or even those who have been uh, uh, recovering from, from drugs, they are stigmatized, but they've also been criminalized. This is a fact. And the same way in which it's a fact that human rights violation is, as I said already several times today, is um, widespread 
specifically amongst key populations. They experience high level of uh, violations of human rights. But we are, uh, um, if there is a book that I would love every single human being to read, it's a book by someone called Stan Cohen, which is called State of Denial. We're often uh, knowledgeable of what is happening, but we choose to be bystanders. I'm summarizing the book in two words, really. It's much more than this. But it's a very powerful book that I think communities should really read, if I may make a suggestion. I'm leaving with this very powerful uh, kind of statement, which is kind of stating, again, the very obvious, the criminalization uh, can help. And I think we should be in a position, in a strong position, because we are well informed and we should push for more research, community-led research, if we feel that is necessary, so we can find alternatives to criminalization. Decriminalization of behaviors is possible. We can influence current legislations by providing uh, community-led uh, data that we can produce, analyze, and put forward to relevant stakeholders. We can do it. We are able to do it. We must seek funding sometimes. Okay, that's my summary, which means that I'm on my way out. Again, there is nothing more that I need to summarize that I haven't said and repeated already several times. But um, something that occurred to me as I was kind of uh, talking is that, um, I think that amongst us as um, community activists and advocates, um, what is missing is a sense of cohesion for what we discussed earlier, but also what sometimes is missing is um, the, the notion that we, can we are change makers. We can change things. We can even change the law that punishes behaviors that uh, society deems uh, um, punishable. We can do it. It's not difficult in a way because we have all the tools. We just need to get together. And we can also get together to ask uh, uh, WHO Europe region to sponsor, to support more research, which is community-led. And when I talk about community-led, and we have been talking about a key population, I think we must involve key populations in research. It's all very well that I do this as a DATG um, executive director. Yes, I can do it. But what about key populations? How do I know what is their experience? We must facilitate, and that's my job as a DATG executive director, for example. We must facilitate a space where key population can talk about what they need and what they experience. We cannot talk on their behalf. They have a voice, all of them. They have different voices. We can only facilitate a space for them to be heard. Okay, I'm on my way out. I've done pretty well, considering that I've stolen a couple of minutes from Chris. So I'm leaving you with a call to action. So this is the beginning, not the end. That's a promise. I have a list of um, some short, very short videos that in your spare time, I think uh, some are very powerful, others are less powerful, but equally informative. And then I've got, as a proper teacher, a short reading list. Thank you for listening to me and for giving me this opportunity. I was really, really looking forward to talk about criminalization because it's my, my passion, if passion is the right word. And you've been a very incredibly well-behaved audience. So thank you. <laughs>